So biodegradation, there's a lot of definitions out there. A lot of them are sort of political and regulatory in, in the details. But the most basic definition of biodegradation you'll see out there is that you know, the bio part means that there needs to be some sort of biological activity going on and that there should be some kind of change taking place. And that, that's really it. And all the details are about what kind of biological organisms and then what kind of changes are taking place. So the most commonly accepted uh, definitions of biodegradability that you'll see in commercial products, like when something is advertised as being biodegradable, those often come from the OECD guidelines and they have a couple of categories. There's ready biodegradability and ultimate biodegradability. And you can see these are, these are pretty complicated definitions. So the ready biodegradability test is you'll have some kind of organic chemical <coughs> that dissolves in water and you set up a 28-day test and sometime during that 28-day test you have to either, well not either, you have to remove 70% of the dissolved organic carbon and achieve a certain level of theoretical oxygen demand or CO2 production within a 10-day window. So you've got all that. So thinking about these different requirements, if we think back to the early classes when we're talking about stoichiometry, what, why, why would we be talking about oxygen demand and CO2 production? What, what's happening to the, to the organic chemical? So we have some generic carbon in there. What's going on? What, what's the reaction? So what, what's reacting? Oxygen and CO2. Yeah. So we have some sort of oxygen. It could be O2 gas. I mean, biological organisms are very complicated. There may be some sort of catalyst involved inside the cell, inside the bacteria. And then your product is CO2. And so you can calculate, as we did earlier in class, based on how much carbon is in your compound, what, what is the theoretical amount of oxygen that you would need, and then what's the theoretical amount of CO2 that you can produce. So those numbers are very easy to come up with theoretically, and then you basically set up the test to measure that. And the reason why they're doing this 10-day this window and a 28-day test is you could imagine a couple of different scenarios. So if this is a time component, and let's say this is CO2 production. So if something is really quickly biodegradable and you know, the bacteria loves it, you might expect something kind of like this. So you get really rapid production of CO2 and then eventually it runs out of the chemical, right? You could have something that looks like this, that maybe the bacteria is not familiar with this substrate and then over time it adapts to it and then starts consuming it. And then you can also have situations where the bacteria just doesn't know what to do with it at all. And if you're lucky, maybe you get 5 or 10%. So something like this, this could, you could achieve your 60, 70% biodegradation in a 10-day window. And something like this, you know, your 10-day window. Both of these are considered essentially readily biodegradable. So in some 10-day period, you're getting rid of virtually all of the, the uh, carbon. And then ultimate biodegradability is kind of a step down. That just means that uh, Instead of a 10-day window, you've done it in a 28-day window. So it's not as fast, but it still gets the job done. And then the, the level of complexity can get almost uh, arbitrarily uh, complex. That uh, Thinking about different organisms that you might encounter in different situations, so um, wastewater treatment bacteria versus soil bacteria, uh, aerobic versus anaerobic, so this is a an important consideration because we were just talking about C plus O going to CO2. Is that aerobic or anaerobic? So that's aerobic. So under aerobic conditions, you have your C's going to CO2. Uh, we have like N would be going to NOx, S going to SOx, and so on. Um, metals, I'll just put M for metals, are going to be going to metal oxides. And then under anaerobic conditions, so there's no oxygen present, you have reducing environment. Does anybody know what, what carbon's going to 
under reducing environments. So where, where would you encounter aerobic biodegradation, like surface and like moving water, um, if you're, depending on what type of, type of compost you're doing? So compost where they're you know, mixing it continuously. How about anaerobic? Where, where, where do we hear about methane emissions and ammonia emissions? Most landfills are packed so tightly that there's essentially no way for the oxygen to penetrate down into where the organic stuff is. And so the anaerobic bacteria thrive under those conditions. So not, not everybody will choose to use OEC def, OECD definitions. There's also ISO methods, EPA methods, ASTM methods, and there are, there are literally dozens, if not hundreds of them. And that basically just speaks to the complexity of biodegradation pathways that um, you know, each organism is going to have its own enzymes, its own catalysts, and probably different intermediates. So the, the methods that go with actually tracking biodegradation are pretty labor intensive. So uh, a lot of them have to do with measuring either your starting material directly or measuring these different gases. So that's what these uh, this dissolved organic carbon DOC dioA that would be tracking disappearance of the carbon, uh, CO2 evolution, O2 consumption, there's different gas detecting technologies. And then to this point about like uh, oxygen depleted water versus oxygen rich water, there's all types of different matrices that you can look at. So soil, um, different types of aqueous environments. Anaerobic digesters are a big one because a lot of people are setting up these biogas facilities where they're shoveling organic stuff into a, an, a, an anaerobic reactor on purpose because they want to capture the methane gas. And there, there are tests where you can simulate composting at different temperatures. So um, in compost, bacteria are used to having higher temperatures. So you have to uh, model that. And then there's processes where you might introduce some other chemical technique. So helping the biodegradation along by using something like photochemistry if the chemical reacts with, with, um, with light or um, like UV radiation. Uh, 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 hydrolytic chemistry can also help these things along and that might help shorten some of these induction periods where the bacteria may not know what to do with the chemical in the very beginning, but if you're sort of pushing that process along through photochemistry, then you can get, get it to look more like this rapid profile.